Hello people, welcome to the community of the Growth Mindset Podcast. Guys, if you are a first time listener, don't forget to subscribe on whichever platform you're listening from so that you don't miss on more interesting episodes coming up in following weeks. And for our daily listeners, here we are again with a new episode where we will interview another interesting personality from a unique industry and understand how they were able to accomplish this great level of success. Remember, this is a podcast where we learn easy, practical methods and tips that we can implement in our daily lives from the very best and the most successful people known today. Because as we all know, success leaves clues. And we the people having the growth mindset will use these clues to create a better, more fulfilling and a successful life. So, let the growth begin. Guys, our special guest for today is one of my most loved men, Scott Stable. Scott is a best-selling author of Big Love, The Power of Living with a Wide Open Heart, and is well known for his inspirational and motivational quotes on Facebook and other social media platforms. On this episode, we will talk about self-love, how we can truly start loving and embracing ourselves, what are the practical tips and tricks that can help us truly live a life of freedom and spreading love and positivity wherever we go. So, without further ado, let's start. Scott, now for my audience uh, who might have not heard about you in case, since we are primarily from India, uh, would you like to tell us about you, uh, your childhood, your background, where are you from and all that good stuff? Sure. Um, well, I'm really, this is my first podcast uh, with a primarily Indian audience, so it's really exciting and fun to be here for that. Uh, mm mm-hmm. I grew up in the Detroit area of Michigan in the United States. So Detroit in our country is known primarily for for two things, for the auto industry, it's where all the cars mm-hmm. were created originally, and for Motown music, like Aretha Franklin and Michael Jackson and yeah. like, you know lots of <laughs> lots of music comes from the Detroit area as well. So that's where uh that's where I grew up. I can share with your audience a uh, part of my past that tends to come up uh when i have conversations because it's a pretty um important part of my story um i lost my parents when i was 14 they were actually shot to death in detroit so that was obviously a very traumatic um profound experience that at at that age something inside of me knew to kind of put it aside that I wasn't ready to process it and really grieve um over the loss so for many years that's what I did kind of locked it away which is something a lot of us do with with grief um yeah. and uh you know went to high school as an orphan and that was really um uh difficult experience and was also coming into my sexuality at the time in high school well not really coming into it denying it yeah. but actually, but acknowledging it at True. the same time um so that was a really you know provocative time for me in my life and then after i went to college in michigan as well and left after i graduated and moved to san francisco and it was when i moved to san francisco at around age 22 that a lot of things in my life started to open up and i started to make space to look at my life um with a little more honesty and a little more clarity and a little more sadness and rage and all the things that naturally come i think with the grieving process that i hadn't really allowed myself to experience so moving to san francisco and also san francisco for being gay is a really great city to to move to <laughs> so so that i was coming into my sexuality i was coming mm-hmm. into my understanding that is an understanding i still have today and really the driving force behind my life and the work i do which is that let love be the guide you know let love direct you return yourself to love consistently ask yourself the question what is love inviting me to do in this moment how is love asking me to show up in this moment and see what happens from that place right because we're yeah. so conditioned to react and to judge and to blame and to hate and to create separation and all of these conditionings 
that our minds are just wired to do so naturally. Like it takes no effort True. to judge another human being. It takes no effort to hate another human being. The effort is in being compassionate, True. being empathetic, being loving, right? And I started to learn in my 20s, hey, wait a minute, this, is, this path resonates. Like this makes sense to me. And that commitment has stayed with me. I'm 49 now, you know, and so it's been half my life just over, um, which isn't to say, by the way, Ershad, that I'm not a jerk a lot of the time. You know, I fall off the love train all the time, True. and as we all do, and we get back on. And what's, what's helped me so much in my life that I've really learned to do because I've practiced at doing it is exactly. to love myself through whatever incarnation of my humanity presents yeah. Yeah. you know it's in i think that i suspect your your listeners because all people um we are so used to shaming ourselves when we're not showing up for our lives the way we would hope to right we go to a, a place of shame which automatically compounds the experience that we're having you know it makes it worse it's like suffering for me is is much less about what i'm feeling and much more about how i'm judging what i'm feeling wow. and if we can practice at removing that judgment and in recognizing our humanity within everything we do and bringing empathy and compassion for ourselves first and foremost we start to live a different life you know and it's um, for me a agreed. much better life <laughs> agreed agreed and yeah. you've touched upon so many important points and I want to break this down one by one so that the listeners get an idea as to how or what, what exactly we're talking about. Starting off from the first thing wherein you said, you know, uh, your parents were shot at uh, the grocery store, right? How yeah. did you deal with such an incident at such a young age? Because there are so many people out there today that may have uh, some tragic or traumatic experience because of which they're not able to come out, especially teenagers when they're not even kind of sure as to what exactly to, to do next in life, right? Yeah. And when you yeah. are brought into face to face with such a traumatic experience, how did you deal with that? So that, you know, some listeners who are listening to us can get tips from you and they could also implement that in their lives to work this out. Sure. Well, I would say how I dealt with it back then is not the, the tips I would give to people right now. So it's, it's, it's in a few parts. It's like mm -hmm. at the time I just survived it. I was 14. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. I was just going, I was just started ninth grade, which in the U.S. is you're just starting high school. So I'm starting a new school. I'm realizing I like boys and I now don't have parents. So I just survived it. And I don't, I don't feel like or shot. I can take credit for how I showed up as a 14 year old. I feel like it was divine blessing because I, I see so clearly how I could have gone down the path of... Exactly screw you, God, I'm done, take drugs, True. drink, do all of these things. And instead, I went the exact opposite way, was like an all-A student, class president, like was really invested in school, very popular wow. kid, lots of friends, lots of commitments, and it served me. So what I would say about grief in general for anybody listening is that there are not rules about it. And so first, I would encourage you not to judge how you are grieving if you're dealing with grief right now because we all grieve how we grieve. There's not a rule, There's not. it's not linear, it's for me True. and for everyone I know it's like this. But later in my, so in my 20s, what I, what I understood was that by not allowing myself to be with what I, was, what I was feeling about the loss of my parents, I was denying myself the deepest possible connections with others in life because I had built so many walls around yeah. my parents' death. I had turned it into a big secret. I had felt ashamed about it and a freak because of it. And it was only when I started to allow myself to sit in the emotions that I was able to see I can survive this. I think some part of, of myself, and I think for other people, we sometimes think if we let ourselves feel the the depth of the pain we're feeling, we won't be able to handle it. Yeah. We'll lose our minds. True. We won't be able to survive it. And yet the only way to know that we can survive it is to allow ourselves to be present with our feelings. Exactly. So that's the tip. The, the main tip I would give to people around grief, around any pain is as much as possible, be present with it. And 
because what so many of us are doing, I don't, I don't know in India, I know in the U S addiction is a monumental issue mm -hmm. and it's not just addiction to drugs or addiction to alcohol. It's addiction to shopping, to food, to sex, to our phones. We are doing so many things to avoid being present with our feelings. Yeah. And what people don't understand is that all that energy we're giving to the escape is actually energy we're giving to the thing we're running from, right? Wow. Instead of just being with it and allowing, emotions are designed to move through us, True. but they can only move through us if we allow them to be present within us. Right. And, you know, be, I think for people grieving, if there's ever a time to be really gentle with yourself, if there's ever a time to just shine as much love on yourself and your path and your journey and whatever you're going through, this is the time. If there's ever a time to really take care of yourself and however that looks, surrounding yourself with people you can trust if you have them in your lives, um, making self-care practices a priority. And it can feel like the hardest thing to do when you're grieving, like sometimes just getting out of bed is enough. Yeah. And you know what? Celebrate those little marks. If all you were able to do is brush your teeth today, that's a victory. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and, and we, I, I think it's really important to give energy to those victories in our lives instead of staying focused on all the ways we're not showing up the way we want to. Exactly. It's all about counting those small victories and making sure that you're counting on the things that you actually did, then comparing yeah. what you've not been able to achieve. Absolutely. And it, that takes work. Everything exactly. we're talking about, because the mind naturally goes to the negative. Yeah. It naturally goes to self abuse. So you're constantly working with a mind that is determined to beat you up and exactly. make you feel less than. So the work is in really being intentional Makes about sense. celebrating yourself, affirming yourself, recognizing your victories. Exactly. And you also spoke about in, you know, one of your ways as to how you inspire people is also, as you rightly just said, you know, coming, uh, acknowledging that special, uh, specific emotion, that feeling, dwelling into it and trying to acknowledge feeling that in your body. But also at times when you are trying to, let's say you have had a very uh, uh, bad traumatic experience. And now when you sit, let's say in a room and you try to acknowledge those feelings and all those feelings bubble up inside of you. And then that can be a very scary zone as well at times when you are actually feeling each and every single part of that traumatic experience. How can we make sure that uh, people do not end up uh, getting depressed? Or getting into that tunnel where you know they they they're, they're afraid to even get out or or see the ray of light. So, how can we protect ourselves from not being depressed? Well, I don't I don't feel the need to protect myself from being depressed. I get depressed, you know, and it's like I'm not afraid of getting depressed the way I used to, which is different than some people who are suffering much more intensive depressions that last for mm. months and months and months at a time is a different thing. But in general. The whole notion of trying to stop depression from coming on is is a way we numb. It's that's the same thing as saying I'm afraid to feel what I'm feeling. Sometimes I feel really depressed. Sometimes I feel really angry. Now, what you're speaking to though is is really important because our feelings can feel overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And in the thing I said about numbing earlier, sometimes I numb. Sometimes it's like I've had enough. I just need to shovel ice cream into my mouth and watch Netflix. Exactly. And that's okay. And the difference for me now between what I used to do is I would shovel the ice cream and watch hours of Netflix and then beat myself up and say, you're a piece of crap for doing that. And why aren't you taking care of your body? And what are you doing to your mind with all this TV? And now it's like, okay, you did what you felt you had to do. It's okay. You're True. human. Right? True. One of the things, truly, Yershad, if there's one... One of the statements I repeat to myself more than any other, it's just, it's okay, baby, you're human. <laughs> and it's like that reminder for yeah. people, I think is so important because we, everything that you're experiencing in your head, I'm experiencing in my head, in my own way. All of cool. your insecurities, I have them too. You know, cool. all of your fears, I have them too. And when people understand that what they're going through in their minds is a product of having a human mind, it's not that there's something wrong with them. True. This is the nature of human minds and human egos. It's part of this story, you know. Now, for people who are, you know, in the throes of depression for months and months and months at a time, I really, I encourage them to consider all, all different avenues for their healing and whatever that could look like. That could look like talking to someone professionally, if that feels like mm -hmm. the right choice. I have friends of mine 
who are on medication that has changed their lives. I have friends of mine who are dealing with their depression um, without medication, you know, and doing that through like deep meditation and lots of exercise, and that's really serving them. What I, I think the important thing to communicate to people is that they have the answers within them. This is what I truly believe, right? It's like, what might work for me may not work for you. Exactly. It's about really giving energy to the choices you're making, feeling into your body when you make those choices, feeling into your heart when you make those choices, and giving energy to the ones that ultimately make you feel better. You know, if people did, if people did nothing but pay attention to their choices and do less of the ones that make you feel like crap and more of the ones that True. make you feel fulfilled, your whole life would change overnight. One hundred percent. But again, everything's easier said than done. <laughs> you know, which doesn't mean it can't be done. It just yeah. means it takes work and practice and commitment. Exactly. And in your case, Scott, you mm -hmm. said you know initially you 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 hold yourself down and you are suppressing, compressing all of those emotions within you, right? But then once you moved out uh, at the age of 20, 21 is when you actually thought that, you know, the world around you was kind of shifting, you were becoming more open. Was there any specific event wherein your, uh, your wall started to break and you realized that, you know, now I'm, I, I actually need to come in face, right in face of my traumatic experiences and deal with them? Yeah, I thought I was having a mental breakdown. <laughs> Honestly, I I would have a yearly cry about my parents from the time I was a teenager up until I was about 22, once a year, like okay. clockwork, and that was it. And then I never cried. And the it came on when I was when I the first year I moved to San Francisco, that yearly cry happened, only it wasn't stopping. It went on for like 3 days in where I'm just locked in my bedroom listening to Kate Bush and being really depressed and just crying and crying and crying and thinking that something in me broke. Like I thought it, I'm, it's broken. I can't yeah. get back to like a, a normal state. Hmm. And, and I should tell you like my general way of moving through life, especially at that time is very optimistically. I was a, the type of person you would meet always had a smile and, Part of that was very real. Part of that is my personality. I, I tend toward optimism, but part of it was like denial for sure as well. Mm. So uh, here I am, this person who's used to like being able to smile and bring myself out of things that was crying and crying and crying. And I, I pulled out, we had something, this was in the 90s, called the Yellow Pages, which was a phone book, mm -hmm. which was this big book of numbers yeah. of services and stuff. Yes. And I went to the section in the in the Yellow Pages to the psychotherapist's mm -hmm. section and literally I closed my eyes and I pointed my finger and I called the first woman that I pointed to and it's it's the only time I've had therapy in my life but I went for six weeks it was all I could afford at the time and I just cried about my parents and raged and cried and raged for six straight weeks wow and that was for me a moment of recognizing it is possible for me to talk about this with someone else it's possible for me to feel the pain of this and i'm still here i'm okay so those six weeks it really kind of brought me back to, to center and then soon after that i got a job at this um metaphysical bookstore in san francisco mm -hmm. a world gift store really but it had this incredible book section with all these beautiful books on enlightenment and spirituality i had never read anything like any of these books and that's what really started to open me up to the possibility of like wait a minute what if what if love is just my mission in 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 the world what happens then right so those two things kind of coincided and, and set me on a different trajectory mm -hmm. and and i love the point wherein you said you actually <laughs> went to the uh, psychotherapist and shared what you were going through and i think that is so important at times like this, when we actually talk to the other person who you trust and then share yeah. your feelings, because that actually brings you to, to a position where you are ab able to talk to what exactly you are going through, feel those emotions that actually at the end of the day, still realize that you're still standing there. It may, Absolutely. It, it 100%. May, it may take a week, some may take months, but at the end of the day, your final, final goal has to be making sure that you're sharing the things and, and having that optimistic idea that, you know, you are going to survive at the end of this. Were you always this optimistic from the beginning or 
did you develop this or did you get this from your parents or your environment you know i think it, for me it's just a it's a gift i'm really grateful for because i think that people are born with certain personality dispositions mm -hmm. you know i think that there's some of us in on the planet who have to work a lot harder to just get to a base level of feeling like life's okay. Correct. And some of us are like, life's pretty okay. And then, you know, you True. start from there. And I've, I've generally been someone who's had that base note of like, let's seek out some benefits in this situation. Let's look for the positive, which doesn't mean I still get very heavy because I'm also a really sensitive person and our world is insane True. and it's so violent and it's, exactly. it's, it's also beautiful and connect it has all that but it is so insane and so violent and when you pay attention to any of it it's hard not to feel overwhelmed by it you know exactly which is why i appreciate the work you're doing because what i understand is that we will always find violence and insanity and disconnection when we seek it because it's everywhere True. so why wouldn't we be seeking the other things that exactly. are everywhere like podcasts like yours that are offering messages of hope and love and compassion and connection and nature, getting out into nature and remembering that the trees are always there for us. True. There's been some of my best healers just connecting and sitting around trees and remembering again, like I am part of this divinity. I have stillness within me in the same way these trees have stillness within them. We are all connected with the same energy, right? Exactly. And where did you get this, this idea of, of enlightenment? Was it, through did you uh, practice uh, spirituality or was this also from books that you read where does all these stories begin yeah it began at that time at the store and several of my co-workers were i unbeknownst to me had a guru they were a part of a cult in the bay area mm -hmm. and they became my closest friends and i wanted to meet their guru of course and then i became a part of that cult for 13 years and uh, wow. yeah i had never I didn't even know the term enlightenment until I moved to San Francisco and started work at the store. And the promise of this guru, the, the, this guru professed himself to be an enlightened master on okay. par with Buddha or Jesus, like that, like an wow. enlightened master. And I was surrounded by these people who believed it to be true. And I, I worked hard to believe it to be true. Even though I had a lot of doubts, I also was constantly reminding myself, well, you're not enlightened, so you don't really know what enlightenment looks like. So even if this doesn't look like enlightenment, you can't be sure. So trust this man. And and I didn't just trust him for that reason. I trusted him because he embodied for me love in such a beautiful way. And he, he preached unconditional love and un unconditional friendship. Like the foundation of his message I resonated with my heart and still does, even though... I don't believe he's an enlightened master and mm -hmm. he could be incredibly cruel and manipulative and so and it was a beautiful experience in my life and i was also able to see this is not the path for me and in this is not how i want to be with people moving forward if i move into some sort of teacher or activist or whatever role i move into i've been given a very clear example of how i don't want to show up and what I was also shown was that the message of love, which is what I responded to in him and about the path, is so alive within me that it, it that message has nothing to do with exactly. meeting a teacher. It's yeah. like everybody listening right now, I believe that you what you you've had you have lots of people on and lots of people sharing wonderful tips and lots of good advice and it's up to every individual for himself or herself yes. to find their way and to Absolutely. decide either this person or this message works for me great or it doesn't or it does but or it did and now it doesn't you know what i mean like if we yeah. pay attention our hearts are our hearts our souls our our bodies are constantly giving us information true, and true. i really encourage people not to get sucked up into any sort of teacher or book or anything just because all your friends like it if you exactly. if something in you is saying no honor that no because when we honor the thing when we honor the no inside of us it, it creates more opportunity for yeses to come into our lives that yeah. absolutely do resonate you know exactly and you you you've really you know uh, 
broken these out summarized this so well for example at times like this we have so many uh, mentors trying to say i'm going to do this i'm going to do that for you and then you realize after a point of time that you know this is exactly not the right teacher for me maybe he may be for somebody else but for me the values do not match you know i don't believe what exactly in every single aspect what he's trying to teach me does not resonate with me now for somebody to accept that right that you know because you've been let's say you're working with them you're learning from them from last 13 years breaking yeah. out of that group when you've been associated with them should have been such a, a daunting task for you how did was, you choose that the decision to come out i mean what how, what was that power that drove you you know i think you get it took me a year wow. from when i was very clear that this is not right until i moved and in part for a couple reasons one because i believed that if i if i say goodbye to him as a teacher i'm going to lose all of my closest friends yes and i did he told them to delete me from their lives and i lost 25 like family members overnight with no just deleted me no explanation nothing wow which was incredibly traumatic and um the other thing i so that came true but the other thing i feared which is i'm going to say this to you and as i'm saying it it's going to sound insane and and i'm a rational intelligent person and when i even think that this is what i was worried about but it was it was hammered into us that if you betray your teacher you will be cursed by god like wow. that message from him was communicated over and over in a variety of different ways and i was doubting his enlightenment but i also didn't know that he wasn't enlightened and i thought what if i'm double crossing an enlightened teacher by leaving his life <laughs> i'm going to destroy my life by making yeah. this choice that prospect is really scary if you believe it's possible for yourself i mean i never looked back once i and and so to get your answer also like how did i finally end up doing it you know i think we get to a point in our lives that i i suspect everyone listening can reflect on at least one moment in their life where it was like the the weight of staying in something finally was worse than the the weight of making that change. Yeah. It was like you can't stay anymore. Yeah. And I that's how I felt there. It's like I knew I would I I suspected I would lose all my friends. I knew I could be cursed by God, but still it's like everything in my being was saying this is not your path. And if we get if if we really really listen, not only listen to ourselves, but if we're willing to accept the answers that come through us, and then follow up those answers with actions we're going to create a lot of change in our lives and it's almost it will always be uncomfortable because yeah. change is always uncomfortable definitely but i never second guessed it not once and this was 11 years ago never wow. once was like what did i do i went through sadness losing friends and missed that community still because it was a beautiful community yeah. but also not so right for me and i love the part uh, where you actually said the reason for you to move out of that was basically because of the pain that you that you had to go through then then you realize that you know i actually have to go through because they say right people make decisions based on two factors either it's pain or pleasure so either you want to get rid of pain that's why you want to move out of that or you want to gain pleasure so you decided you realize that you know the pain of staying at this place is going to have worse effects on me that's why i need to move on and then Absolutely. you decide and then you decide to move on and people the the wild thing about human beings all of us is that we will stay in miserable situations just to avoid having to make a change in our lives because the fear around change is so great inside of us that we would rather be miserable in our comfort zone of misery True. than actually expand beyond it and exactly. when you start to understand that the gifts that come from expanding your comfort zone the gifts that come from moving forward with your fear and and dipping your toes in these changes they're indescribable you yeah. know they're indescribable and once you start making them even if you have to drag yourself into it even if it is just the most painful struggle once you start doing it baby step by baby step you start to build within you a certain kind of resilience that for me i feel it keeps showing up for me it's not that i'm afraid all the time there's always an element of fear there when i'm doing new things but my fear has come to understand that it isn't the dominant factor the way it used to be 
Yeah. So I'm let, I'm in conversation with my fear from a much friendlier place. And I'm like, look, come along for the ride. I know you're doing your job, but mm-hmm. you're back there, baby. You know? True, true. And uh, <laughs> talking about, uh, I also know that there were a couple of times in your life where you actually left a couple of jobs as well, right? Like, like many jobs, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> so that also takes a lot of uh, guts and, and decision to actually decide to move out from one place to the other. Right. For example, you were, I believe you're working at you, you wanted to become a lawyer and you worked at uh, at Tony's office as well. But then after some time, you realize that is not your cup of tea and then you moved on. So you chose basically your happiness over uh, something which you did not like. Yeah. How can people also put themselves in your shoes or make that decision to make sure that, you know, they choose happiness over something else? Are there any practical suggestions that you think people can do? to to become like that yeah make self-love a priority Mm -hmm. truly because what happens when we make self-love our priority when and and when i what i'm saying is basically dedicate yourself to loving yourself because when you do when you start to do that and i'll give you one way for people to do it today write yourself a love letter and i'm not joking like sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and write yourself a letter for you, it's dear Shad, and and be absolutely um, emphatic about why you love yourself. Absolutely emphatic. And for this exercise, for some people, is a great struggle because a lot of people have trouble loving themselves. Yeah. If it's a struggle for you, first of all, no worries. That's okay. That's human, right? Mm-hmm. But don't stop there. Don't stop in the resistance of that struggle. Right. If you can't come up with reasons because you're so blocked by by your mind's desire to tear you down, mm-hmm. think of the people in your life who love you the most, and think about some of the reasons why they love you, and start putting those things into your letter. Because what the the practice of self love does for us is it starts to instill in us our inherent worth, and when we understand that we are as we are, no, you don't need to do anything differently. Everyone listening right now, you are worthy. As you are, you are as worthy as every other person on the planet. When you really start to understand that, you start to make different choices in your life. Because if I'm staying in a job where I'm absolutely miserable, energetically what I am saying is that I am not worthy of something better. That's the message that I'm communicating to myself, if you believe in God, to God, to the trees, to whomever. To whatever and that's a really heavy message to move through the world with and so many of us are moving through the world with this message of lack of worth and we accept relationships in our lives exactly. that, that are disrespectful jobs all all these different circumstances we create from that place but conversely imagine if you are intentionally working at self-love by the thoughts you're allowing into your head by the actions you're taking in your life that reflect self-care and love if you're constantly doing that, the communication is, I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy. And that communication, it's like when I move through the world from a place of worth, I am open and yeah. expansive. And when, the, when you are moving through the world like this, the connections you make, the experiences you invite, it's wholly different than when I am not worthy. I am, yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. The, the lack of worth energy, it's just all shut down. There's no invitation for exactly. connection and possibility and so that's why i i feel self-love is the most important choice we can make because of course it benefits ourself but it benefits everything anytime so, you're acting from a place of love self or for others you're serving the world in a positive way and the, the buddha has one of my favorite quotes he said if you truly loved yourself you could never hurt another and for me that is the essence of self-love it's understanding that when we are so steeped in love of self all we have to offer the world in return is more love and more love and more love and from that place you're powerful beyond measure when you're operating exactly. from love what can touch you True. you know it's basically it, what you're trying to say it's more like you coming from a place of abundance from a mindset of abundance than coming from a mindset when people have scarcity saying you know this is not what i should be deserving or what i shouldn't be deserving in the first place and talking yeah. about love and self-love, Scott, uh, you give one very practical advice right now, writing a love letter to ourselves, right? And mm-hmm. we go this, we hear this almost everywhere we go, right? Self-love, self-love, self-love. Right. But nobody's talking about 
how to actually develop that, right? How do you actually start loving yourself? You give yeah. one practical advice. Can you name? I'll give you name? more. Yeah, can you give us two more? The the word, um, the way you pronounce the word, we I say scarcity and you say scarcity, but in in English, how that sounds to me is scar city, which is a really <laughs> funny way to look at scarcity because when you're in scarcity mode, you're just scar, you're living in scarcity. So I love that. That was great. Interesting. Um, um, yeah, this is first and foremost, start monitoring your thoughts. Mm -hmm. This is not it. What I'm, what I'm going to say is it's the, it's the easiest thing to do in the world and also a really difficult thing to do. True. It's easy in that when you start paying attention to your thoughts, the moment you're aware that your thoughts are self-abusive, the moment you're aware that you're tearing yourself down, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, I'm less than, I'm worthless, offer yourself something different. Offer yourself words of affirmation, words of love. Mm. The moment you're aware of it. The thing about our thoughts is they're happening like this. There's so many thoughts happening. That yes. don't even Exactly. But the moment you have consciousness is the moment you can take action. True. You may have been beating yourself up for 10 minutes. Okay. But the moment you're like, I'm beating myself up right now, stop yourself. And what can you offer yourself? Mm. You are worthy. You are beautiful. You have shown time and again, your resilience and your strength. And this, the daunting aspect of this practice is that when we start to bring awareness to our thoughts, we become really aware of how horrible we are to ourselves, yeah. right? But, but, and it can feel overwhelming. It's like, I'm beating myself up again. Oh, now I have to offer myself words of affirmation, blah, 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 blah. But the alternative, Urshad, is that you just continue beating yourself up. The alternative is that you just True. continue being miserable. So anytime you're offering yourself words of love, you're connecting to the energy of love automatically, anytime. And so you're serving yourself in this I am so practiced at this, which is why I feel like I can talk about it confidently. I am so good at loving myself that even when I'm tearing into myself for something, there is always a voice. It's like, you're beautiful, baby. I love you, baby. No, no <laughs> nice. worries, baby. Truly. And that voice tethers me to love. And it keep, it's like, it, it takes practice, but it's a practice that yeah. pays off. So, so your thoughts, but also your words and actions. So mm -hmm. how are you, how are you moving through the world? How are you showing up for yourself in a way that reflects self-love? What choices are you making from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed? If you start looking at the choices you're making, like I said earlier, and really checking in with yourself, when I hang out with this person, how do I feel? I feel really disrespected and bad. That is an act of self-betrayal. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to judge yourself for it, but it's worthwhile being aware of it and making a different choice, right? Setting clear boundaries, looking at different ways we can show up with self-love. These are the most, for me, the most practical things we can do. What are my thoughts saying? Offer myself love if it's not nice. What are my actions indicating about what I feel about myself? Do more of things that make you feel better about yourself. Yeah. So, so my book, Big Love, I write about a lot yeah. of things and some of the chapters are really heavy and some of them are much lighter. And of all the things I've written about in there, and I share everything about my, not everything, but, you know, a lot, the, the chapter the most people will write to me about and thank me for is this chapter on self-care where I encourage people to throw out their uncomfortable underwear. And I tell them how I had this realization while I was working at my computer and I was shifting in my seat because my underwear were so uncomfortable. And for like two hours, I'm trying to get work done and I'm shifting and I'm like, I hate these underwear. Why are these underwear so uncomfortable? Before this light bulb went off where it was like, <laughs> take them off your body. Like this is so, you can take yeah. care of this. This, is, this. There's an answer for this predicament, Good right? Day. And I took them off and I literally, I was so angry at them. I grabbed scissors <laughs> and I snipped them and I went to my underwear drawer and I pulled out the pairs that I know don't feel good and I threw them away. And so I share that in the story and so many people are like, I threw on my underwear. Thank you. You're right. I don't need to be because everybody can relate to wearing uncomfortable exactly. underwear for no good reason. reason yeah. right? And on the one hand, it's a really, it's a really silly, simple, stupid thing. But on the other hand, if we are making choices in the most basic way that reflects self-abuse, you can be assured we're making choices where it matters more that reflects so, self-abuse. And conversely, if you start looking at those basic choices, how am I showing up for myself in the day-to-day? -day? 
and you throw out the uncomfortable underwear and you look at the other things where it's like, this reflects self-love. I'm loving myself right now. This is how we change our lives, I believe. Exactly. I am totally on the same page as you because it all starts from our habit or, or let's say our trait of loving ourselves, right? Because once you understand who you really are, what your, what your morals are, what your values are, and what are the things that you will accept and not accept, your your decisions are going to be totally different, right? You you will be somebody who will stand up for yourself. If somebody's belittling you, you're going to tell him up, the, up, up front on the face saying, see, I love you, but you know, you can't be doing that to me. I don't respect yeah. that, right? And you, yeah. you will respect yourself more in such a way that you're able to find solutions for you rather than you being pulled into something that you don't like all the time. Absolutely. And it's contagious. You know, it just, it feeds on itself. Yeah. It replicates itself. The more you start showing up in your worth, the easier it becomes to do so. And exactly. And as you said, it all starts from those small little things and build it up to all the big thing. It's not like one fine day you, you decide that, you know, you're going to love yourself and then you talk, start taking those big decisions wherein, you know, your, your psyche has not yet built those continuous wins wherein you've taken all those small, small yeses and made sure that you're making yourself more and more comfortable on a regular basis. Absolutely. And human nature is to want everything at once and to exactly. want things to just be fixed in a snap. <laughs> and look, my experience is it's life. It's the work of a lifetime. This True. journey of self-growth and healing. I don't, ex I don't expect to ever stop working at it. You know what I exactly. mean? I don't expect to ever have arrived in a place where there's not more to learn and deeper levels of acceptance and love to realize within ourselves. Yep. Yep. And what does your normal schedule, day-to-day -day schedule look like, Scott? What exa how are you spending your day? Yeah, these days it's, it's varied. I'm very nomadic in mm -hmm. my life. I left Michigan, which is where I was most recently living, uh, several months ago. And I've been fairly nomadic. I was doing a lot of camping. And, and now I'm, I'm living with a dear friend. We rented a cabin in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, in this beautiful kind of mountainous area. Mm -hmm. And just living very simply. So my day is very simple. I come out to the, um, I come out to this airstream that I'm coming from right now. There's this mm -hmm. trailer on our on the property. It's mm -hmm. this really fun, funky space to kind of work and do some writing. I'm I'm currently facilitating. I was I give a lot of workshops. Yeah. So I was traveling a lot and giving in person workshops with groups, which we're not doing now, of course. Yes. Um, but I just launched recently. I'm in the midst of doing a group workshop with someone and I have two more of those starting in January. So nice. I was re re a little bit resistant to online workshops, but this first group's been so beautiful. And the, the level of energy and connection that can happen through Zoom is actually pretty extraordinary so, when open hearts are present. You exactly. Know? Exactly. So, so I'm not, living right now. It's very relaxed, mm -hmm. I would say. So let's say if you're starting up, what time do you normally wake up? And then do you have some schedule, some routine around how, how you should be spending your time? Or maybe uh, some self-affirmations. Do you do things of that sort? You know, I would say yes and no. I would say I'm not in much of a routine now, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I can get in phases in my life where I'm very routine. When I'm in, when I'm feeling, I would say when I'm serving myself the best, which I'm not doing right these things right now. Mm -hmm. It's when I wake up and meditate first thing in the morning mm -hmm. and do some sort of exercise, which I am doing right now, but it doesn't happen first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And get out in nature to take a hike of some sort or just a walk, um, which I haven't been doing as much because it's getting really cold here. <laughs> um, uh, so those types of, for me, those types of rituals, nature, um, physical activity, healthy eating like the things that everybody does i feel like the things that we know are good for us when i'm doing those things in a routinely way it's it's good for me right now i'm being really um just kind of patient with myself and, yeah. and allowing myself to do what i feel like doing right now correct right and now. i think the time itself is like this where you know everybody's routine and uh, has, has just gone for a talk because most of the people are working from home and it's not how Absolutely. it was let's say a couple of months ago Right Absolutely. now, the only phase is to just survive. Make sure you're keeping your sanity alive. I think if you're yeah. just doing that, you're able to do good. Exactly. And, and give, be graceful with ourselves. Be gentle with ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And you also talk a lot about compassion and empathy, right, Scott? Yeah. So what are some ways in which people can actually practice more empathy and practice more compassion? How can we become more of that? Look, empathy is easy, but it's a choice. 
you have to choose to do it. We all are empathetic in our nature. And for me, that choice, the choice of empathy just means taking the time to put yourself in another person's shoes, taking the time to imagine what another person's experience might be like before condemning them and screaming at them and hating them. And it is within all of our power to do that. And when we do that, we're much less likely to show up to a conversation or to type away on our keyboard from a place of hatred. It's just not what happens when you when you empathize with somebody. Yeah. So the, the actual act, act of empathy is easy. Like if you're, okay, someone's pissing you off, take a moment, be with your anger, of course. That's fine, to, you know, anger's a great emotion. It shows us a lot. But take a moment to just imagine, well, what might they be going through? Mm. What might their life have looked like to get them to a point where they said this thing that has angered me so much? I'll give you an example where empathy has played a, a massive role in my life. It's been around the man who killed my parents and feeling nothing but rage and hatred for years and then starting to realize this rage and hatred is not serving me. It's just poison in my being. And feeling like at some point I need to forgive this man and I have no idea how. So I'm, I, I'm going to start by imagining what his life might be like, imagining him as more than just a murderer, trying, yeah. connecting to his humanity and recognizing that anyone who kills innocent people is, has got to be dealing with feelings of rage, feelings of loss feelings of confusion, feelings of not being seen, not being loved. All of these things that I imagine would go into the embodiment of someone who would make the choice he made. Yeah. And I could relate to all of those things. It's like, I know what it feels like to feel unloved and unseen and lost and confused and angry. And even the violence, which was the one thing I thought I could never relate to the violence of murdering people. I wanted to murder him like i wouldn't i don't think i ever would have done it but i imagine yeah, scenarios exactly. violent scenarios toward him over and over again so even that violence i could relate to hmm. and suddenly he's not just a killer suddenly i'm looking at a brother suddenly yeah. i'm looking at a, a, another human being, human being in this difficult reality who made a terrible choice and yet is worthy of love and forgiveness like all of us and the gift that came from that empathy, and I believe empathy is the pathway to forgiveness. And the gift that came for me was realizing when I would reflect on him, I'm like, I have forgiven this man. I am no longer tethered to him through this connection of hatred and violence and blame and agony. It's like, I can love him. And it started with empathizing. Please. And you were going from that place of love as well, right? As you said, you, you, you disregarded the entire hate, rage. You are not coming from that move, but you move to a place when you are actually more lovable and making sure that you are open to love as well as also forgiving the other person because those emotions were not serving you, such as rage or angry. I mean, that is so important at times like this because I personally know of a lot of people who are angry all, all the time, frustrated all the times, but they don't realize that this is actually like a poison that is hampering them. So, how was this process for you? Like, you, you, you forgiving your, let's say, uh, the murder of your parents is not easy, right? But how was this process? How long was it? And when did you realize that, yes, you have forgiven him? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say I started to actively empathize with him somewhere in my early 20s. And I don't, it wasn't like a lightning bolt that exactly. came down. It's like, I've forgiven him. It's all done. <laughs> True. It was more, it was just this kind of realization when I would think about him, I'm like, Oh my God, my heart is open to this man when it never was before. I love this man. So I don't have an answer for that. And I also don't think an answer is what is, would serve anybody because there's no yeah. rule. Yeah. Like sometimes you can come to that place in a minute and other True. times it could take years and you could come to that place and have forgiven. And then suddenly it comes back again with this man. It's never come back. Like once I reach that place of forgiveness, it's like the forgiveness has been there for decades now. Um, but it, I, I think it's just really a, can you take the time to imagine what it's like to walk in another person's shoes? Because yeah. that alone is an act of love. The yeah. moment you choose empathy, you're choosing love because love is the base note. The moment you choose compassion, you're choosing love. This is yeah. just a representation of love through the lens of compassion. When you, when you get to forgiveness, 
Forgiveness is a representation of love through the lens of forgiveness. You know what I mean? It's all it is all the baseline. It's all coming in from love. Always. A hundred percent. Which is why it, it's so insane because we know how it feels to love and we, we still make justifications for hate over and over and over True. again. It doesn't make any sense. True. Uh, I see that, uh, you know, uh, Scott, we are coming to an end, but there is one question that I really want to ask you, right? Uh, you understand the importance of having the growth mindset, a growth mindset wherein, you know, you are open to learning, growing, acknowledging, becoming self-aware, all of these things, right? And again, it's an ongoing process, as you said. It's not just one day activity. Every single day, you're making conscious decisions to make sure you're growing to the next level. So if you had to give, let's say, two practical advice to everybody on the planet in terms of developing this growth mindset, what those two advice are going to be from Scott to the world? Okay, one, this is in line a bit with what I said earlier. Um, There's great value in practicing at being a witness to your mind instead of becoming your mind, Um, which is to say that I make a practice of looking at my mind the way I look at other body parts. So my hand is here to grip things, to wave to you, to feed me. There are all these these things that my hand does when it, when I'm moving through the world, it has all of its purposes, right? Yeah. The, our legs move us through the world. Our feet balance us, right? Our mind is here to, it, it's imaginative. It recognizes beauty. It takes care of logistics. It also operates in fear, creates insanity, creates disconnection. This is just what the mind does. But we become our minds in ways that we would never think of becoming other aspects of our beings. If our mind is is suddenly driving us insane, we become the insanity. If my hand is hurting, I'm not suddenly a hurt hand, right? And I think it's been helpful for me to remember that. Like, my mind is just doing what minds do. Your mind is just doing what minds do. But you are not it. So practice at playing witness to it. Practice at being an audience member and mm-hmm. watching the story of your mind play out without becoming attached to it. The spiritual teacher Muji put it in a really in a great way. He said, imagine yourself as a screen. When the screen is on, when there's a fire on the screen, like if you're watching a movie screen, if there's a fire on it, the screen is not burning. If there's a waterfall, the screen doesn't get wet. And I like reflecting on my mind that way. When my mind is insane, if I can separate myself from it and just watch it, I'm not insane with it. True. Right? We're the spectator. That is so deep. Yeah. And it's 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 a really that's a really challenging practice. Exactly. But again, with practice, you can start doing it more often and suddenly you're not living in insanity as as much. Because when you're when you're not your mind, what are you? Who's watching that mind? True. Where is that place coming from? What depth yeah. of, of peace, what depth of center knows to watch it, right? Yeah. So I encourage your listeners to do that. Okay. And you wanted a second one. Yes. For me, I'm going to say what I said earlier. As far as the growth that I've, I'm, I feel like we're all always growing, but the growth that I feel I've achieved, the most important growth, has come from an absolute dedication to love and asking myself the question. So here's the practical tip for for listeners throughout the day when you're feeling yourself, you know, going crazy, going insane, getting upset, getting this, getting that. If you're able, just stop yourself and ask yourself the question, what is love inviting me to do in this moment? And then center yourself in that place of love that is so alive within you and outside of us and everywhere. And just hear, listen for the answers that love invites and see what that does for your life. Awesome. So guys, here you have it from Scott Stable himself, uh, giving some great, amazing insights as to how you can actually go to the next level and make your life a much more happier and a life wherein you're spreading more love and more awareness and more positive vibes. Uh, before uh, I let you go, Scott, how can people reach out to you? Where are, where are, what are some places they can find you? Oh, sure. I mean, they can find me on Instagram, just at my name, Scott Stabile. They can find me on Facebook at the same. And my website is scottstabile.com. So if you type my name in and if you want to find me, you'll find me. Perfect. 
So thank you so much, Scott, for taking your time out and joining us on the Growth Mindset Podcast. It was a pleasure to have you. Oh, my, my joy. Thank you so much, Ashad, for all you're doing. This brings us to the end of this episode and hope you at least had one takeaway from this interview. If you have any questions or want to talk to me personally, you can find me at www.silavatirshad.com. See you soon. Thank you.